Hello everybody, this is Dr. Schleit. <clears throat> In this video, I'll be going over the learning objectives related to matter and materials, uh, chapter 7 in the Ace Physics course book. As usual, keep a record of your work in a journal. Send uh, scanned copies of all the pages of your journal to my email by noon Friday each week. Alright, as I mentioned, these are the learning objectives uh, in Chapter 7 of the Ace Physics course book, and we're going to define density, define pressure, and calculate the pressure in a fluid, understand how tensile and compressive forces cause deformation, describe the behavior of springs, and understand Hooke's law, distinguish between elastic and plastic deformation, define and use stress strain in the young modulus, and describe an experiment to measure the young modulus. All right, density is the amount of matter in a given unit volume. <clears throat> or the amount of mass, you know, per volume. So, mass is the amount of matter, and volume is uh, sort of the amount of space. And so we're really thinking about density as how much matter we can kind of fit into a given you know, unit space. Um, we know that we measure mass in kilograms, and we can measure volume in meters cubed. So that's the sort of the base units of volume, uh, but we might be more familiar with like uh, gallons, you know, as, as a volume or liters, you know, uh, milliliters. And so those are all units of volume. And density just relates how much mass is in um, a given volume. We can kind of think about things with a lot of density, like a black hole, where we have, you know, especially supermassive black holes, where there could be millions of stars worth of mass occupying, you know, basically no size at all, and so black holes could be thought to be, you know, infinitely dense. Uh, here's a picture, uh, sort of like a, a really broad perspective, uh, where you see sort of the Virgo supercluster, um, which our galaxy, the Milky Way, is, is kind of a part of. Um, or we, we kind of look out towards the Virgo supercluster. Um, really, a few years ago, um, we can see that we're part of a much bigger structure called Laniakea. I think I have a slide on that in the next one. But the point of this slide is to sort of point out that there are these voids in space that sort of exist between these superclusters of galaxies. And so this gravity sort of pulls um, galaxies together there's space in between that, that become these sort of cosmic voids, and we could imagine trying to calculate the density of a, of a void, um, and it would be, you know, lower than if we were to sort of measure the average density of the universe in a place where there's more superclusters. But on the largest scales, um, we can kind of look at the homogeneity of the universe and kind of see that, you know, that there's just as many clusters as voids, and so on the, the very largest scales that we can observe, the, uniform, the universe is actually very uniform. This is, as I mentioned, Lani Ikea. Uh, I think the L got sort of cut off there. But this this whole sort of region of space, and you can kind of see here the local group, that's a, sort of we're a part of. And I think they've even pointed out some voids here. Adonis Void, Delphinus Void, Cygnus Void, Gemini Void, Leo Void. Um, and then these groups and sort of clusters of, of galaxies. Pretty cool. All right, so again, density is the amount of matter in a given volume of space. We use the Greek letter rho to represent density. Kind of looks like a lowercase p. All right, so if there's more mass in a given unit volume, then that would be a higher density, and this one here would be something with a lower density. So what density is. Here are a few practice problems uh, related to density. So one says a cube of copper has a mass of 240 grams and each side of the cube is three centimeters long. We want to calculate the density of copper in grams per centimeter cube and in kilograms per cubic meter. All right, I think we can do our working over on this page here. And so let's remind ourselves of what the, it says here that So we got kind of a cube here, and the size is 3 centimeters long. We're going to try and calculate the density of the units of space, miles per volume. So meter per volume in this context, right? Is, again, it's a unit of velocity. So 
40 grams per cubic centimeter, which is the substitute of 40 grams per 3 centimeters cubed. And so here we're uh, cubing both the number and the units as well. So let's see what that means. myself that centimeters cubed is centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, right? So it's like every single um, dimension of this cube, the length, the width, and the height. It's so sort of how we calculate volume for a shape like this. And so that's where we're sort of volume equals length times width times height, right? Take that this. But now we need to convert from grams to kilograms, and there are 10 to the 3 grams per kilogram, or a thousand grams per kilogram. Uh, and then we want to convert from centimeters to meters, and there are 10 to the 2 centimeters, or 100 centimeters per meter. we got to remind ourselves that we have to convert that three times. So you can be mindful that we need to, uh, there are 10 to the 2, 4, 6 centimeters, right? 10 to the 6 or a million centimeters per cubic meter. Or we just are mindful of converting it sort of this way, and then we sort of cancel out all three of the centimeters. And now we're in per cubic meter, and we cancel out grams. And if we just multiply 8.9 times 10 to the 2 times 10 to the 2 times 10 to the 2, right? All together, this would be a million. So 8.9 million divided by 1,000 divided by 10 to the 3. We divide by everything in the denominator. And this will convert grams per cubic centimeter into kilograms per cubic And that equals 1,900 kilograms per cubic meter. All right. Maybe you can read the second problem uh, there. I'll give you a moment to pause the video if you need to get any of that working down. I'm going to go ahead and clear it as we read through the next one. The density of steel is 7,850 kilograms per cubic meter. Calculate the mass of a steel sphere of radius 0.15 meters. And it even gives us a hint here to first calculate the volume of the sphere using the formula 4 thirds pi r cubed and then use the density equation. So we're given the density uh, and we're given the radius of the sphere and we're asked to calculate the mass of this sphere. All right, let's go ahead and do our working on the next page. So first we're given the density is 7,850. So we have the density, the density is 7,850 kilograms per cubic meter. And we have a sphere of radius 0.5 and we're asked to calculate its mass. All right, so you have a steel sphere, and the radius is given. Remember that the volume of the sphere is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed. And so we can substitute the radius 4 thirds pi 0.15 meters cubed. Calculate the volume of the sphere. Uh, 
I get for a volume in cubic meters uh, 0.14. Because we know that density is equal to mass per volume, and we want to know the mass, we can rewrite this as mass is equal to the density times the volume. Sometimes, uh, especially with a fluid, we might be able to measure the volume of something, and if it has no density, then this gives us a way to sort of deal with uh, how much mass there is. So the density is 7,850 kilograms per cubic meter. The volume we just calculated to be 0.14 cubic meters. Here we see that cubic meters will cancel, and we'll be left with kilograms of mass. So 0 0.014 times 7,850 equals 110.9, uh, about 111 kilograms. And we kind of think about uh, three significant digits or two significant digits. And so um, I feel more comfortable as 100. Even though it does round up in my calculator, um, you know, should we report this to two or three significant digits? I think so. This answer seems reasonable. <clears throat> All right, so those are just example problems uh, related specifically to density. Make sure that you know the equation and that we can, uh, and also that you know the formula to calculate the volume of different objects. And we'll go over some helpful hints of that. Pressure is defined as force per area. And we can calculate pressure in a fluid by sort of deriving an equation that you see here, the hydrostatic pressure formula. So pressure is equal to density times the acceleration due to gravity times height. So we can kind of, it says static fluid pressure does not depend on the shape, total mass, or surface area of the liquid, right? We can kind of like, it just really depends on these things, the density, the gravity field, and the height of sort of how much fluid is above the point that, that you're measuring it. Um, we'll see where this equation comes from on this slide here, where we will derive uh, the pressure of a fluid Consider this uh, tank of water here, so it's not a cube, but it's you know, a rectangular river. Remember that we first have to sort of have a, a general definition of pressure here. The general definition is going to be uh, pressure is equal to force per area. So in general, pressure is force per area. Keep in mind that the density of something, right, and so let's emphasize density rho, distinguish it from P pressure, density is equal to mass per volume, right? And so when we have sort of a, a fluid like this, it's easier to measure its volume, length times width times height, and if we needed to know sort of um, its mass, well, if we know what the density is of this fluid, like the known density of water, for example, for a tank of water, then we can start to consider, say, the forces acting on this. And so a tank of water has weight, right? Because it has mass, it has weight. And so this is sort of how we introduce G into this equation. Remember that we're deriving the equation that the pressure is equal to density times acceleration due to gravity times height. So sort of see where that comes from. All right, so let's start with pressure here, and the force is indeed the force due to gravity or the weight, and so we'll make a substitution here into our pressure equation where force is the weight of this fluid, mg. So here it's still divided by area. So I'll just use A for that. Let's think about what mass is in terms of density and volume. Remember, one of the examples we solved for the mass of uh, something, and so we can rewrite this as is equal to the density 
times the volume. And the volume of something, we could always kind of think about if it's a 3D shape, um, what is the area of sort of the, the two-dimensional base and then multiply it by the third dimension there. So in this case, they call it the depth. And so the area times depth, uh, we call it the length, and we could call it the thickness. Um, so length times width times height, so it could be the height. And so in this case, <clears throat> we could kind of think about how we multiply the two-dimensional area by sort of the third dimension here, the, the height of this um, sort of rectangular. So if we make this that the mass is equal to the density times the volume, and the volume is really the two-dimensional area times the height. Then all the math here is mass density times area times height. And if we substitute that in for mass, we get density times area times height, or mass. We still have a G out here. And remember, we still have area in the denominator from the original um, definition of pressure over here. So area cancels, and this is how we get our final equation, that pressure is equal to density times acceleration due to gravity times the height. And so it's saying how much water there is sort of above the points down here where we... Um, measure the area is really determining what the pressure is. It's the weight of all of these sort of water molecules that are acting down on this surface down here that give rise to pressure. So the density tells us sort of how compact the matter is there, and so it makes sense that if it were a higher density, then the pressure would be greater because there's more mass, right, that that gravity field is acting on. So this equation is helpful to keep in mind. Pressure equals density times acceleration due to gravity times height, where h is the height of all of those sort of particles above the point that you're measuring the pressure. So it's the pressure sort of at this point where h is all of this distance sort of above. Pressure is defined as the normal force acting for a unit cross-sectional area. And so here's just some really good sort of textbook definitions. Pressure, force per area, as we mentioned. Its units are newtons of force per meter squared of area. And so one newton per meter squared uh, is one pascal of pressure. And remember this equation. Pressure equals density times acceleration due to gravity times depth or height or thickness, right? Whatever you want to call sort of that, that third dimension. A chair stands on four feet, each of area 10 centimeters squared. The chair weighs 80 newtons. Calculate the pressure it exerts on the floor. All right, so remember that pressure is force per area, and each one of these uh, legs has this area, and so you'd have to get the total area of the four feet. And so it would be 80 newtons divided by 40 centimeters squared, or two newtons per square centimeter. Uh, you could convert the square centimeters into square meters to get pascals of pressure if you wanted to. Uh, I'll leave it for you to do that. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Another way to think about um, the definition of pressure and how to calculate pressure in a fluid is with this um, pressure gauge called a manometer. And some gas of unknown pressure would be fed into this tube, and then here we'd have uh, reference fluids, for example, water and mercury. And here we have sort of the air pressure that that's sort of pushing down on. And so by looking at the change in height here, we could use the equation that we just uh, derived a moment ago to be able to determine what this pressure is of this, um, the, the unknown pressure over here, the, the gas that we're interested in. So the gauge pressure, the change in pressure, would be the difference between sort of this pressure and atmospheric pressure, and atmospheric pressure is, is known, 101 kilopascals, would equal the density of the liquid times the acceleration due to gravity times this change in height right here, right? Because this gas is sort of pushing down this, 
right, and, and against this, and so we sort of balance these two pressures here, and the reference fluid allows us to determine what the pressure is of the um, the unknown pressure over here of this gas. Calculate the pressure of water on the bottom of a swimming pool if the depth of water in the pool varies between 0.8 meters and 2.4 meters. The density of water is given as 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and it says if atmospheric pressure is 1.01 by 10 to the 5 pascals, calculate the maximum total pressure at the bottom of the swimming pool. And then it wants us to estimate the height of the atmosphere if atmospheric density at Earth's surface is 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. And again, atmospheric pressure is 101 kilopascals. For the first problem, uh, we really only need to consider the, the maximum depth of the pool, 2.4 meters, because it asks us sort of at the bottom of the pool. But this is a swimming pool that sort of has you know, like a shallow end and a deep end, so we really only need to calculate the, the deep end here. So 2.4 meters is the height, the known density of water, 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, and atmospheric pressure, 1.01 .01 by 10 to the 5. And we want to know what's the um, pressure of the water at the bottom of the pool, and then the total pressure at the bottom of the swimming pool. So let's think about sort of what's the difference between those two on the next slide. So again, we've got our swimming pool, which I will approximate as this rectangular prism. And shallow end and a deep end there, and the deep end uh, has a height of 2.4 meters. And I just realized that I'm probably drawing where my, my face is, and so. Got this little over here, and it's got a height of 2.4 meters. Swimming pool heights two. In the deep end, the density of water is a thousand kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, we want to calculate the pressure at the bottom of the pool, so we know that we use rho h and we substitute a thousand kilograms per meter cube for the density of water, the acceleration due to gravity, 9.1 uh, always newtons per. Another way to think about meters per second squared, meters per kilogram, meters per field strength, and the height, 2.4 meters. You can see that kilograms will cancel, and meters will cancel one of these meters, and so the final units will be newtons per meter squared, which you may recall are pascals of pressure. The pressure at the bottom of the swimming pool is 2,000, I'm sorry, 23,544 is the capture value, which we could maybe round to 23,500 pascals or newtons per meter squared of pressure. Now that's due to the water. There's also atmospheric pressure, you know, sort of acting upon pool there too. And so to calculate the total pressure at the bottom of the swimming pool, we would add the 1.01 .01 by 10 to the 5 pascals of atmospheric pressure. To get a total pressure of 120 5,000 pascals. Right? 1.25 by 10 to the... And so the water 
adds a little bit, you know, more pressure to the atmosphere pressure, right? But we're on still in the same order of magnitude, 1.25 by 10 to the 5. We were also asked to estimate the height of the atmosphere given uh, the density at Earth's surface, 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter. All right, so this was the working on the first swimming pool problem. <clears throat> Let's think about estimating the height of Earth's atmosphere. I think they gave us like the density 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter, and we're asked to sort of estimate the height here, given that the pressure is they give 101 kilo pascals, right? So that's another way. You know, kilo is 10 to the 3. You kind of see that if it's 101 kilo pascals, that's the same thing as 1.01 .01 by 10 to the 5 pascals. So right? just different ways. Like the decimal point is implied to be here. So if we move it back this way, then we add two more sort of. <laughs> Uh, to the exponent there. So 1.01 .01 by 10 to the 5 pascals is the same thing as 101 by 10 to the 3 pascals, which is the same thing as 101 kilo pascals. Kilo means 10 to the 3. And then we can kind of clean up the scientific notation and think about it like this if you want. So pressure equals rho g h, and the given density was 1.29 kilograms per cubic meter, acceleration due to gravity 9.81 newtons per kilogram, and the height is what we want to know. The pressure is 1.01 .01 by 10 to the 5 pascals. So if we divide each side of this equation by sort of 9.8, the product 9.81 times 1.29, then we'll solve H over here will be pressure divided by density times acceleration due to gravity. One point one by ten to the five divided by one point three nine divided by nine point one. I get seven thousand nine hundred and eighty one. So let's call it uh, seven thousand nine hundred eighty or about eight thousand meters. All right, and so remember that a pascal is a uh, newton per meter squared, and so uh, let's write it like that, newton per meter squared. So the newton would cancel here, and then these meters squared would cancel out two of those, and this meter, which remember is in the denominator here, um, sort of moves it back up to the, to the numerator in our answer. And so we've got 8,000 meters uh, for an estimate of the height of the atmosphere uh, based on the, those given conditions, those given initial values. Work done by an expanding gas, and so this was from our work energy power uh, chapter, and it's just something to, to sort of recall here. So the work is equal to pressure times change in volume, and now that we've uh, talked about pressure, it makes sense to kind of revisit that idea. And so when a gas sort of pushes a piston, it does work on it, it expands it. And so that change in volume times the pressure 
So it's equal to work, which remember is sort of energy. So work done on or by a gas, right? If we compress a gas, we sort of do work to it. If the compressed gas are out, then it can do work. And this is how we can calculate it. On a plot like this of pressure versus volume, sort of is the area sort of underneath that, that curve there, right? Where the change in volume is the final minus the initial, right? So represent this base, and then the height would be sort of the pressure here if we plotted pressure on the y-axis. So the work done, pressure times change in volume. Another learning objective was understand how tensile and compressive forces cause deformation. And you can see from the figure here what each of these forces sort of means. A tensile force is when we're sort of pulling something. A compressive force is when we're you know, squashing it or pushing the ends, compressing it. And a shear force is when we're sort of like pulling on, um, you know, sort of either side. So you imagine it's like glue in between these two things and there's a shear force where they sort of want to pull apart from each other. Whereas the tensile force is like we're, we're stretching, um, you know, like a, a wire, a, a piece of metal, or really anything. Um, so tensile is sort of pulling, compression, pushing, and then a shear force, you know, sort of like pulling apart. Understand how tensile and compressive forces cause deformation. So here we had what was a square object that a force was sort of uh, exerted to it. And so we see a compression force along this side where those ends are a bit closer together and a tension force at the other uh, sort of diagonals where those there would be a sort of a pulling there where those ends are getting further apart. So both of those forces would be present uh, by deforming an object like a square uh, cube. Describe the behavior of springs and understand Hooke's law. It's really good to have a statement of Hooke's law. Um, so when the elongation in a spring is proportional to the force applied, we say that that spring obeys Hooke's law. So that's what Hooke's law means. So Hooke's law is obeyed where the elongation uh, and the force are proportional to each other. So if we were to plot a graph, which is actually the focus of our lab work this week, of uh, as we add more weight, the force due to gravity, to a spring, we want to measure its elongation, and we want to see, is, are those things proportional? When they are, we say that the spring obeys Hooke's law. But as you can see from this plot, there comes a point where the spring may no longer obey Hooke's law. And so here, it looks like the plot starts to sort of rise towards infinity, and this would mean that uh, as we apply greater and greater force, the spring doesn't really sort of get much longer. Um, Likewise, down here, um, if we were to compress, so elongation would be sort of to the right of this, right, where we're applying force, but if we um, applied a, a negative force, right, then we'd be sort of pushing it, and then the spring would compress, compress, compress. So there are points where the springs will no longer obey Hooke's law. Distinguish between elastic and plastic deformation. When a spring returns to its, ori its original shape, that's what we call an elastic deformation. We've only changed it elastically and it's able to sort of go back to its original shape. There is a point that we could exert such a force that the spring would sort of lose its, its structural integrity and it's no longer going to return to its original shape. We sort of unwound the spring. And that would be an example of a plastic deformation. Uh, a plastic deformation on a plot like this, which we'll, we'll talk about in a moment. This is really a way to look at young modulus, which you may recall we have a few learning objectives for. Um, but related to what we're, we're talking about here with, with Hooke's Law, we'll see some of the same quantities that are sort of embedded within young modulus that, um, for example, force, we're talking about how the force applied to a spring causes elongation. And elongation, um, you kind of see right here, like a change in length for something. And so we'll, we'll come back to these uh, sort of symbols here and define them. Uh, the point of this figure here is to kind of show you that we can still see where there's a constant slope right here. And this would be sort of a material that, let's say we were examining its young modulus, but we could also kind of see the, the behavior of a spring within there because, again, we're kind of looking at um, some of the same quantities. So here it's obeying Hooke's law, and then it gets to a point where it no longer obeys it, 
and then it would get to a point where it actually sort of breaks, and that's represented by this X right here. So, Young modulus is a way to sort of look at the strength of materials. Here we see kind of the same thing on a stress strain diagram. There are regions which are elastic, you know, where sort of the, the um, force and the elongation is proportional. It's elastic but no longer linear. Um, here it's permanently deformed by, by the stress, and then there might be a fracture point where it's going to actually break. And so sort of looking at how this curve sort of behaves, we could uh, see sort of the, the strength of materials. Once the stress is removed, it returns to its original shape. That's sort of what defines an elastic deformation, whereas a plastic deformation is a permanent deformation. Here, indeed, are the definitions of stress strain in the Young modulus. So stress, represented by the Greek letter sigma, is the force per area. Note that's the same way that we define pressure. The Greek letter epsilon here represents strain, and it's just the... Um, ratio of how much longer something became compared to its original length. And so here they have the elongation E compared to like one like unit length, how, how long it originally was. And then E, the Young modulus, is the ratio of stress to strain. So stress over strain is the Young modulus. Uh, the symbols that sort of I prefer we use when we're talking about epsilon, um, the strain would be the extension over the original length. So strain equals the extension, okay, or elongation over the original length. Sigma, the stress, equals force over area. And because Young modulus is stress over strain, we could sort of rewrite this complex fraction as force times original length over area times extension. Blacks. Young modulus equals FL over AX, and you sort of put all this together. And oftentimes problems with Young modulus um, will be given enough information that we'll have to sort of substitute it in sort of like this, and we'll be solving for one of the other ones. And so just sort of keeping one form of this equation in mind, Young modulus E equals FL over AX, we could always rewrite this to make the thing we want to sort of solve for the subject. And remember, keep in mind what we talked about area, Sometimes we might be measuring, you know, something like uh, a wire, and we could think about a wire as being like a cylinder where the 2D um, shape is a circle. And so by knowing sort of the radius or the diameter of that, we'd be able to calculate the 2D area of a circle, pi r squared, times the length, right? And this would give us kind of like the volume of the wire there. And so... Um, <clears throat> Sometimes we have to sort of think about the two-dimensional area, and that shape might be a circle if we're measuring something like, you know, a wire. Like, if we apply a stress to a wire and make it a little bit longer, um, we'd be measuring the young modulus there, and the area would be the area of the cross-sectional area of the circle. Here's sort of the same information. Uh, you've got stress measured in newtons per meter squared, right, because it's force per area. You have modulus is stress over strain, and strain is the change in length divided by the original length. Again, I prefer kind of x over l. This is the way I prefer to sort of use the symbols. They all kind of mean the same thing. So as long as it's clearly defined, you can use whatever symbols you, you prefer. Here we have a couple of sample problems, a piece of steel wire 200 centimeters long and having cross-sectional area of 0.5 millimeters squared is stretched by a force of 50 newtons. Its new length is found to be 200.1 centimeters, so see the change in length is only 0.1 centimeters. Calculate the stress and strain and the young modulus of steel. Right? So we're sort of using this data collected to get the stress, strain, and young modulus. And then a similar problem where we're going to calculate the extension of a copper wire of length one millimeter and diameter one millimeter when a tensile force of 10 newtons is applied to the end of the wire. The modulus of copper is 130 gigapascals. And remember, giga is 10 to the 9. If you'd like to see these example problems worked out, just don't hesitate to ask a question in class or leave it in the comments down below. Otherwise, I'll leave it to you to kind of work through these 
based on the equation for Young modulus and stress and strain that were covered in the previous slides. The final learning objective was to describe an experiment to measure the Young modulus, and the apparatus that you see on the screen would be sort of the typical setup to determine Young modulus. If we think about what Young modulus is, again, it's defined as the stress over strain, which is force times original length divided by cross-sectional area times extension, right? So it sort of became this. And so if we think about it, if we really wanted to determine the Young modulus E, we'd have to measure all of these things, the force, the original length, the cross-sectional area, and the extension. And this setup allows us to do all of that. And so the force is going to be the force that we apply to the object in this case. Remember, like the steel wire, so we could suspend a wire uh, on a lab bench, you know, clamp it down at one end and hang it over a pulley. And then we could add mass and therefore weight to the end of the, of the um, wire. And that's going to be the force. So it's going to be the force due to gravity. The original length, you can see the ruler up here. And so we'd be able to measure the original length of the wire. <clears throat> so the original length with the ruler, the force by having known mass. And remember that mass is related to the force due to gravity by the equation weight equals mg. The cross-sectional area of the wire, we have to use something like a micrometer screw gauge to uh, measure that. And so this is a device where we can sort of pinch down on the thickness of something that's, that's really, really tiny. And it allows us to make very accurate readings. And so we can measure something like 0.462 centimeters. Okay, And so we use the micrometer screw gauge to measure the cross-sectional area of the wire. And then the extension we get if you have really good eyes, you might be able to say that there's like a little piece of tape that's on um, the wire. And so as it gets stretched, we'll be able to sort of see where this piece of tape moves to on the ruler behind. And so the tiny little change um, where this you know, piece of tape moves to will give us the extension there. And so the extension we get by sort of putting, a, putting a piece of tape on the wire, and then as we add the force to it, it stretches and... We see where that tape moves to and that would give us the extension. And so by measuring all four of these things and then plug in this equation, we get the young modulus. We could also think about, you know, the force, um, measuring that, the mass, and then calculating the weight, and then dividing it by the area that we get by measuring the diameter of the wire. And then remember that the diameter can give us um, the area because we assume that it's a circle, so pi r squared. So by measuring the diameter and then dividing it by two, we have the radius, and that would give us the, the area. So we can kind of think about plugging it in to give us stress, and then plugging in the extension and the original length into this equation to give us strain, and then taking the ratio of those two to give us the young modulus. So however you prefer to, to think about it, we've got to measure four things and the ratio of, you know, two of them give us stress, and the ratio of another two, x over l, give us strain, and the ratio of stress to strain gives us the young modulus. <clears throat> a safety precaution when you were doing an experiment like this would be to make sure that you've got, um, you know, good sort of protection, something like, you know, goggles or even a face shield might be good because if this string snaps, you know, you want to have a way to protect your face. Uh, here's another slide and it may be blocked by my face up here. Um, so just go ahead and click on the assignment and take some time to see if uh, this makes sense of that. In the lab, I can let you see a micrometer screw gauge, and uh, it's just easier to sort of make sense of it when you're when you're looking at one. But again, by um, sort of spinning the thimble here, we can clamp down on something that's sort of really really tiny, and then there's a way to sort of read it off here um, to just sort of add up very precisely. Like this is the five. Um, you know, centimeter mark or millimeter mark, and then it's halfway to the next one, so plus 0.5, and then this, you know, as we sort of turn this, we're moving, you know, half of a, a millimeter at a time, and so this actually goes to the 
0 0.25, 0 0.26, 27, so 0.28 is on this line. And then, so we'd read that out. And so this would give us very sort of uh, precise readings. 5.78, you'd be able to sort of just add up what the um, micrometer is telling you. The sleeve, the thimble. The sleeve reads 0.55, the thimble reads 12 divisions here, and so that's 0 0.012, and so the total reading is 0.562 centimeters, tells you the space sort of in between and pinch down on there. Here again is uh, another slide on describing an experiment to measure the young modulus that we talked about before. Lab day this week is going to be an exploration of Hooke's Law, where we're going to vary the mass and therefore the weight suspended from a spring uh, and measure the extension. And then we'll use Hooke's Law, F equals KX, to plot a graph of the force against the extension. And the slope of our best fit line will give us K, the spring constant. So it tells us how many newtons per meter squared, um, sort of how stretchy the spring is, how many newtons of force it takes to stretch the spring. I'm sorry, not meter squared meter. How many newtons per meter? Newtons per meter squared would be what? Pressure. So newtons per meter is uh, the spring constant. How many newtons of force to stretch the spring out one meter? So right there is going to be our independent variable. We're going to vary the mass and therefore the weight, force due to gravity. And then the extension right there is going to be the dependent variable. As we vary the weight on a spring, we will measure the spring's extension. By plotting a graph of force versus extension, we can find the slope of the best fit line, which represents the trend in the data, and this is equal to the spring constant K, again, in newtons per meter. We will uh, graph all of our data, and in your reasoning statement, you should reference Hooke's Law, okay, which, remember, is force equals Kx. <clears throat> and there is a negative sign in front of the K because... Uh, whichever way we sort of apply a force, the spring is always sort of acting against it. So when we stretch a spring out, the force in the spring is trying to sort of pull it back. If we compress a spring, right, it's trying to sort of push back. And so there, there is a negative sign there to show that that force opposes the um, direction of elongation or compression. <clears throat> As usual, our... our um, trend is going to be linear, so the equation of a line y equals mx will plot our forces on the y-axis against the extension on the x-axis, and then the slope m will be our conclusion k, the claim we want to reach. What is the spring constant in newtons per meter? The other thing that we could look at with our graph is calculating or taking the area underneath the curve, and that would actually tell us how much elastic potential energy is stored in the spring. So at sort of our maximum elongation, we could take the area underneath that curve, which would be a triangle, and um, force times extension, right? That's sort of uh, the definition of, of work, right? Um, force times displacement. Work is force times displacement. So sort of the work done on the spring as we stretch it out is now equal to the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. You can think about that as either one half force times extension because this is a triangle, right? So it's one half base times height. Or if we substituted Hooke's law for force, remember force is kx, then we could think about the elastic potential energy as being one half kx squared, right? Just plugging in um, kx for force, we get one half kx squared. And so that's kind of cool. We could determine the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. Here is Einstein's field equation, and you can see here there is a stress energy tensor, right? And so, you know, we're talking about stress, strain, uh, work, energy, power. Um, this is an equation which sort of uh, represents the universe, one of my favorites, but well beyond the scope of this course. Something to look forward to. Elastic potential energy, here's a couple of example problems related to that idea. A force of, 10, of 12 newtons extends a length of rubber band by 18 centimeters. Estimate the energy stored in this rubber band and explain why your answer can only be an estimate. A spring has a force constant of 4,800 newtons per meter. Calculate the elastic potential energy when it is compressed by 2 millimeters. Right, so think about, based on the equations that were presented, how you might go about calculating these. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask or leave it down in the comments below. I'll leave it to you to work through these example problems.
Here's another sample problem where we're asked to sort of work through the cross-sectional area of some fishing line, the weight that's added to it. Um, my weight is not on the line. The extension is 50 millimeters and the stress is. So they give you the stress and we have to sort of calculate the weight, the strain, and the young modulus and the cross-sectional area. This sounds like a good one. Please don't hesitate to ask me in class to solve it. Uh, but in the interest of time, I'm going to kind of work through the rest of the slides here. And then I'm more than happy to uh, work through these calculations if you're having trouble with them. And I'll leave the answers down in the comments below. Spring has a force constant, K equals 80 newtons per meter. The spring is compressed by 0 0.060 meters and placed between two trolleys that run on a friction-free horizontal track. Each trolley has a mass of 0.4 kilograms. When the spring is released, the trolleys fly apart with equal speeds but in opposite directions. And we want to know how much energy is stored in the spring when it is compressed by 0.6 meters. Explain why the trolleys must fly apart with equal speeds and calculate the velocity of each trolley. This sounds like it's really connected to that law of conservation of momentum that we just studied last chapter. We'll do this one in class uh, this week. Another idea that's beyond the scope of this course, um, but very fascinating, so um, hysteresis, kind of like memory foam, okay, where it eventually returns to its original shape, but there's, there's sort of like an imprint there. And so that perfectly saw a moment ago, loading, we sort of add weight to it, but then it does indeed return to its original shape, um, but it sort of does so with some, some sort of memory there, all right? Uh, a few years ago, there was an uh, article written in Nature, Electronic Style Hysteresis in an Ultra-Cold Quantum Gas. And that's very much related to an exotic fifth state of matter that was first theorized by uh, Albert Einstein and Satyendra Bose. Bose. Um, so it's called Bose-Einstein condensation. And if you uh, follow this link here, you can learn all about Bose-Einstein condensation. Very fascinating stuff. And that's the end of uh, the learning outcomes here. So there's lots of practice questions in the uh, slides here. And be sure that you work through those and don't hesitate to ask me to work through them in class if you have any questions about them. Make sure that you're getting all of the key definitions down um, because we're getting to the point of the year where we're going to start reviewing. And we've studied, you know, seven chapters up to this point and there's been plenty of definitions, things that we just kind of have to know to earn marks like, you know, state, um, what is meant by density, right? So just having a good textbook definition in mind, like mass per unit volume, uh, is really good. All right, until next time.